In the examples of inoculation theory that we've examined, we've noticed that a weakened version of a threat is sent to an audience or sent to an individual receiver in a way that gets them to elicit a response to create more information or to otherwise secure their previous existing beliefs. So for example, if you're an environmentalist and you're also throwing your cigarette butts out the window and someone calls you a litter bug, well perhaps that inference that then you're not an environmentalist causes you to rethink your position about whether it's acceptable to throw that cigarette butt out the window. In this way, the threat that you're a litter bug causes cognitive dissonance and asks you to reconcile your previous beliefs that you're an environmentalist with your position that it's okay to throw cigarette butts out the window and change one or the other. Either you're not an environmentalist or you're not otherwise going to be continuing to throw your cigarette butts out the window. That means it elicits a certain vulnerability within your own self-identity and by provoking that threat, getting you to do more research and confirming your own beliefs, well I am an environmentalist and I won't throw that out the window anymore and I can do better than that, actually makes you an arguer for the person that was proposed to. In this way it actually develops unique arguments specific to you and allows the speaker who gave you that argument in the first place to actually inoculate or spread new arguments from new positions in ways that actually grow the argument. However, as scholars studying inoculation theory, we should note some weaknesses or reservations of its theoretical premises and of some of its explanations or the findings that have come from its key principles. One thing to note is that it's really unclear as to how much timing is needed between the inoculation message and the event of some sort of behavioral attitudinal change. We don't know if it's a simple single instance of something like a commercial message, if it takes a series of repeated messages, or if a single message decays over time. And so there are certain questions that scholars of argument and communication studies are focused on answering as it regards inoculation theory. Additionally, there are questions about what makes people more or less likely or susceptible to be inoculated. Research tends to suggest that it relates to things like motivation or their knowledge of awareness of counter-arguments that are otherwise used to debunk or to challenge the initial threat. And so in this sense, there has been an increasing number of studies that are done to delay the time between the pretreatment and the attack and the research tends to find that about two weeks is the right amount of time for inoculation to set in or before it starts to wear off. In this sense, there's additional research now being done to ask whether we should be doing booster sessions or increasing the amount of inoculation messages that are being sent to audience and receivers in order to create a certain sink in or a lasting effect, not only in behavior attitudes, but in behaviors as well. So, as we wrap up our lecture on inoculation theory, there are a few key takeaways that we should recall and remember if asked. The first thing to note is that inoculation is really helpful and useful when it comes to motivating audiences who are already interested in the topic. You can easily inoculate individuals to learn more about a subject or to take action and educate, get educated or even educate others if they're already interested in the topic and if they're already motivated to do so. However, inoculation is less helpful for otherwise changing firmly established attitudes and behaviors. It's more effective at otherwise getting individuals to increase their self-efficacy or their sense of their ability to accomplish the objectives. However, as we've noted in the discussion of its limitations, more research remains to consider the post-inoculation talk potentials and also the use of booster sessions. Interesting research is being done to conduct whether or not things like post-inoculation talk lead to more or less change. And what they mean by that is, if you receive an inoculation message and then you talk about that with friends and family members, does that then make you a representative of that issue or that argument in ways that now because you are talking about it with others, you are more likely to also be persuaded. Interesting research happening in the field of persuasion and communication studies. Other research and communication studies has found that when targeting individual self-efficacy or sense of self-belief, one way you can do that is if individuals feel like something is outside of their range of interest or knowledge, something they don't really have a lot of potential, perhaps politics. Some of us feel like our vote doesn't matter. And if you feel that way, perhaps it wouldn't really matter to have a whole lot of rational appeals or otherwise have a lot of angry appeals to get you to vote because you feel like, Al, anger, my voice doesn't matter. In terms of the rational stuff, it's not worth spending my time to think about. And so typically the appeals that politicians will use most effectively are appeals that move towards your happiness. Vote for me and you'll be happier. Doesn't matter whether or not it's rational. Doesn't matter whether or not it elicits anger from counter responses and other individuals. Instead, 
Focus on what will make you happy. That sense of low self-efficacy is often balanced by a sense of, but it'll make me happy. Alternatively, if individuals feel like they do kind of have some stake in the game and perhaps they have some interest or investment, it might be best to use rational appeals that encourage them to do their own research to find out more about the issue or topic, hopefully in ways that support the opinion you're trying to persuade them towards. And third, if individuals are already highly motivated and incredibly interested, anger appeals tend to work the most effectively, though we can question whether those are most ethical. I think we see this all the time in the context of our political campaigns. Those individuals who are most invested in a political candidate, who feel like they have the most efficacy, my vote matters and I'm going to elect this individual, I'm knocking on doors and I'm talking to individuals and telling them to sign petitions, well, those individuals tend also to have a high level of not necessarily anger, but expressiveness that might otherwise work most effectively for them. So if we think about which of these three is the most effective or the most challenging to inoculate when considering something like individuals pre-attitude, how they feel about something before the message, how they feel about something as they're involved with the message, and then how they feel about their abilities to engage self-efficacy after the message, the one that's often the most challenging to inoculate is of course pre-attitude. You simply can't change their mind about a position that they already held or that they already hold. Think about this a little bit like the affirmative's burden of proof in presenting an argument. We can't inoculate you against the status quo. We can only inoculate you to have opinions for or against future changes. Whether those be future changes in facts, values, or beliefs, inoculation requires getting individuals to change a position from what they already currently hold. So coming up next week, in our first lecture, we'll have our final theory related to persuasion. By then, we'll have covered six different persuasive theories that you can choose to write about in your fact campaign paper. The final theory we'll close on is related to social identity theory, and we'll talk about how social identity theory is useful for understanding the way marketers, health communicators, and other individuals involved in political campaigns seek to create in-groups and out-groups in ways that create more favorability for their products, their candidates, or the ideas that they're marketing in health or social marketing context. Then we'll transition to our social marketing campaign unit where we'll begin talking about the various different campaign strategies used to sell ideas. Of course, social marketing is distinct from the marketing of products, but for those of you experienced with commercial marketing, you'll likely find some applicability to social marketing as well. Thank you for sticking with me through these videos and thank you for your time today. This concludes our presentation and we'll be back with more of these video lectures as we continue to post them throughout our online semester. Don't hesitate to reach out. Of course, I'm available on the Google Hangouts line and of course, you can email as well. The virtual office hours are set up to be on Monday from 10 to 12 and Tuesdays from 1 to 2 p.m. That just means those are the hours by which I'll be most maximally available for you in an instant reply. But of course, you can send me a Gchat of all hours of the day and I'll respond typically within two hours if it's sent between 6 a.m. or 6 p.m. And of course, I'll respond the next day or as soon as I'm able if sent outside of that time range. Again, thank you very much and hang in there. We're all in this together.